Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. If you're visiting, joining us online for the first time, I'm Pastor DJ. So thankful to have you as part of our service. Let me just give you just a few quick announcements before we open in prayer. Uh, I know uh, we are um, expecting uh, some possible bad weather this afternoon, so um, just uh, stay tuned. If we uh, would have to cancel the service, we would send out a one call, uh, post it on Facebook. So we're not going to make that decision now uh, based on what what we have uh, the warning right now, but uh, if we do need to make that decision, we'll make that um, this afternoon. So just be aware of that. We do want to invite you back uh, to the evening service tonight if we have it. Uh, We have been praying about our youth pastor search, and tonight we're going to be in Titus chapter 1 and looking at the biblical qualifications for a pastor. And so if uh, you have 
plans uh, when we do find a candidate to vote on that candidate. I would really encourage you to be here tonight or get a copy of the CD or download the podcast when, it, when it's made available. Uh, these are qualifications that any of us who are ever going to vote on a pastor, we need to be aware of what those God-given qualifications are. And uh, that's a segue to remind you that if you uh, weren't able to be here last week to hear Dr. Brewer, we just had uh, an amazing service last week and uh, just incredible uh, testimony uh, and challenge from Dr. Brewer of World Help, a founder of World Help regarding the persecuted church. Uh, that um, will be available online, that message as well, our podcast, our CD ministry. If you uh, want to hear it again or if you didn't get a chance to hear it, uh, you will have the opportunity, and I, I just encourage and challenge you uh, to listen to that message. Next Sunday will be our family Sunday, and that means that in the morning there will only be one morning service that will be at our regular 1030 time a Sunday morning no Sunday morning Bible study next week no children's church next week no nursery next week we have one service uh, for all of the body uh, next Sunday morning and then next Sunday night at 530 which is an hour earlier than normal uh, we'll be having a movie night and uh, so I'm not going to tell you what the movie is because I haven't finalized my decision yet, for one thing, all right? So I'm not even 100% sure yet which of the movies I'm going to choose. Uh, but that'll be uh, in the fellowship hall. And this time, we're going to make um, uh, the nursery open for our kids, just like in children's church, anyone under the age of eight. We're going to have Veggie Tales playing down there. If you are not a big movie person, but you love Veggie Tales, and you, and you already have your child clearances... <laughs> And uh, you'd like to, um, to hang out with the kids, please let me know that because we want to make sure we have enough adult supervision down there in that room. So please see me after the service. We'll get you on that list. Um, but uh, if, if, you know, veggie tales aren't your thing or you just want to uh, hang with the adults, I invite you to do that with us uh, next Sunday night. I know we have another number of other announcements that we'll deal with later, but I'm going to ask you right now to stand with me. We're going to ask the Lord's blessing as we gather together in his name, in his presence for his glory. Let's ask his blessing on the service. Father, we know by faith that you are here among us this morning. We are gathered in your name. We're gathered for your glory. We are gathered as God, the family of God, but also the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we ask that your spirit would have free reign uh, among us, that all that we say and do in music and giving in word and praise and in the study of your word, God, that it would bring glory to you, God, and that our hearts uh, would leave here changed because of, of what you do here this morning. We love and praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing. Let's sing this hymn together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, all they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking? Some of you, you got the joy of the Lord in your face, and I think some of you need some, some of that joy shared this morning. So why don't you turn, find somebody you haven't talked to yet. Welcome them to church this morning. You can move around for a second. Are you all in the blood? Coming soon, when the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you gone this spotless Sunday white? 
beside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for his soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Thank you, choir, and good morning, everyone. Is the microphone on? It is? Okay. 
have a number of announcements and a few prayer requests today. Again, youth and the kids choir will meet tonight during the evening service. Uh, Wednesday morning, our weight group, Healthy Habits, uh, will meet at uh, 9 o'clock for weigh-in, and the Bible study starts at 9.30. Awana, Awana will be this Wednesday at 6.15. Uh, the ladies' Bible study starts again this Thursday, uh, January 26th. Please see uh, Robbie for any details. Uh, we'll be having a special and a very short business meeting on Wednesday, February 1st, after the prayer meeting. Uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Thank you. Oh, wow. I know. We're not going to go over, over everything. I hope you could read lips. Uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering uh, continues through the end of the month. Uh, the ushers can come forward now. Um, we do have a praise. There were three professions of faith Thursday night down at the mission. Uh, the flowers on the platform are in loving memory of Irvin Ollery. Continue to keep Dean and his family in our prayers. Uh, Kenny Butts is home from the hospital but still in a lot of pain. Uh, Amari Ali is at Ruby with stomach issues. Uh, we need to remember Bob Mallow, Adam Hunt, Tom Burke, Peggy Williams, Dave Mowinney's Aunt Ruth, George Davis, Debbie McKenzie, Ronnie Hess, Carla Norris, Tom Hatter, Troy Van Meter, Bob and Carlene McCullough, Roy Ann Loy, Betty and Leroy Shipley. Also, our missionary Emily Greenwald is attending a training and nationwide celebration this weekend of 100 years of Christianity in Cambodia. They're expecting 10,000 to attend, including the Prime Minister. So please pray for safety, encouragement, and ministry opportunities at that church today. Uh, many others who are sick and have lost loved ones, our youth pastor search, and continue to pray for our nation and the persecuted church. If you bow, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, uh, we thank you for this opportunity to be in this house today. Uh, Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the salvation that we have through Christ Jesus. Uh, Father, if there's any today that do not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, we pray, uh, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation. Uh, Lord, we do pray for the service in Cambodia. Uh, Father, I pray there that your word would go forth, and Lord, that many, many would come to know you. Uh, Father, we are certainly a very needy people. We've mentioned many on here that are sick, uh, have surgeries, uh, illnesses, and Lord, there's many that are not on here. Uh, you know the needs of each and every one here, and Lord, I just pray that your comforting arms could be around us. And Father, uh, again today, uh, Lord, may Satan be bound in this service, and may you have full reign. And Father, as we pause to give back just a small portion of what you've blessed us with, Lord, may you use this to further your kingdom, both here and abroad. And the Lord, we love you, we praise you, we ask this all in Christ's name, amen. <coughs> Amen. Remain seated, but sing with us as we worship the Lord together. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade, I'll never enough. Yeah. 
around us and we think, how can God possibly make a way? At least that's how it feels to us. But we have to remind ourselves, when there was nothing but darkness, God said, let there be light. And there was light. We serve the creator of the universe. There's nothing impossible for him. He is the end of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. He is the first, the last, the one who matters most. He is creator, ruling, sustainer,
Sundays, just like you, I'm up here, I'm tired, I didn't sleep well. I'm trying to focus on the words that we're singing, and so what I try to do sometimes is just close my eyes and imagine what my grandparents are seeing, what our friends and loved ones who are up there are seeing before the throne of God, and how they're worshiping, and how I'm going to be with them. We're all going to be worshiping the Lord together someday, and all of this fatigue and all of this grief and all this pain is going to be thing of the distant past is it will wipe away our tears and we get to worship him right here and now in expectation of that day sing this with me who has held the oceans in his hand who has numbered every grain of sin kings and
Father God, we, God, we do want to adore you, God. We want to come today right now with the eyes of faith, your children, and God, see you with the eyes of faith. God, with the eyes of faith to see what Isaiah saw, what our loved ones are seeing right now in heaven, God. The Lord high and lifted up, seated on his throne. And Father, as we go to your word today, God, may we do so with an attitude of humility and thankfulness. God, may we be encouraged and challenged by the word that you have for us and for every church today. We love and thank you and praise you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. All good things in this life must come to an end, including the age of the church. And today we're going to look at the last of seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation. After this, the word church will not show up. The church will not specifically be mentioned, although I believe we see the church in chapters 4 and 5 in heaven. But again, the church will not be emphasized as the church until the very end of the book. The spirit and the bride say come. Every spirit-filled church is anticipating and calling on the return of the Lord in these last days. But sadly, many churches are not spirit-filled. In fact, many churches are not really churches at all. They are churches in name only. They are counterfeit Christianity. And that's what we're going to see today as we look at the lukewarm church, one of the most devastating and staggering I'm sure, guys, you've had this conversation or some form of it with your wife when you realize she's angry and you're really not sure why, and then she's doubly angry because you don't know why she's angry. Somebody say yesterday. <laughs> this is the situation at Laodicea, blissfully unaware of the disgust that Jesus Christ has for this church. Now, as I was looking at, um, you know, try to find slides and PowerPoint images that go along with the message, I saw a lot of talk about lukewarm Christians. I do not believe these are lukewarm Christians that we're going to look at. I believe this is a lukewarm church full of, full of people who are not truly saved. And I'm going to show that to you, Lord willing, this morning. But this is a church blissfully unaware that God finds them lukewarm. And while there are certainly strong things said to other churches, Ephesus rebuked for being a church that teaches all the right things but for all the wrong reasons because they have left their first love and a warning to repent before God removes the church. We saw the compromises of Pergamos and how God rebuked them for their compromise. We saw how God had a startling judgment on those who would commit spiritual immorality with pagan worship, bringing pagan worship into the church. Jesus saying, you want to commit spiritual fornication? I'll throw you into bed. I'll throw you into a bed of sickness and judgment and wrath. And then to the church of Sardis, the, the living dead church, the zombie church that has a reputation for being alive but actually spiritually dead. And now to this church, a church that is told that they are neither hot nor cold and that Jesus will spit them out of his mouth. We've talked again, Ephesus is the beloved 
church, but a church that has left its first love. Prophetically, it pictures the apostolic church that was pure in doctrine for the most part, but yet was lacking love. Remember, these are historical churches. They're also symbolic churches. There's always been these seven types of churches throughout church history. But they're also prophetic in the sense that they very clearly will see it again today. You want to believe in coincidence, you want to be a coincidence theorist, that's on you. But time and again, God very clearly prophetically illustrates the progression of the church age to where we are today in the Western church. The Western church is reflected in the letter to Laodicea. Smyrna was the second church. That was the persecuted church predicting 10 days, 10 official Roman persecutions. Pergamos, meaning married to the tower or married to the city. The compromising church. Uh, The church became a state religion and enjoyed freedoms they had never enjoyed before and at a high cost to their integrity and their teaching. Thyatira was the result. The church of of continual sacrifice, a corrupted church, again, as I've already mentioned, that adopted pagan practice into the worship of the church. We see the compromised church, uh, A.D. 312 to 600. Of course, these are just rough estimates. Jesus doesn't give us these dates. These, we're not dogmatic about the dates, but we can see the rise of Thyatira. Some would date that around 600. These last four churches, though, are distinct we, we talked about why I'm not going to go over all that again this morning. But all four, one of the reasons is all four of these churches have a reference to the end times, unlike the first three churches. And to Thyatira, they are given great time, a great period of time to repent. But because they have not repented, they've chosen not to repent, they are going to be cast into great tribulation out of Thyatira. Sardis means those escaped. There was the living dead church, which some, somewhere around AD 1517 with the great, the, um, the historically agreed upon date of the great reformation. Of course, there were reformers before Martin Luther. There were things that were happening before Martin Luther, but Martin Luther is historically generally viewed as the one who began the great, uh, uh, great reformation. And what did we see? We saw a, a migration away from the uh, corrupted church, but the revival that that sparked was very short-lived, and those many of those churches, they lived on reputation only. They had a reputation for being alive, but Jesus said, you, you don't preach the gospel. People aren't getting saved anymore in your churches. You're a zombie church. You're a, the living dead church. But out of Sardis came the Philadelphia church. The Philadelphia church would not need to worry about the thief in the night coming as Sardis because the, the Philadelphia is the one that the thief is coming to take. The thief is coming to this church of brotherly love, the faithful church who has given the open door of ministry. We can Uh, date this church and the missionary explosion uh, that followed around the time of the second great awakening at the end of the 1700s and the evangelism that continues around the world today. We had testimony to that given to us just last week. Our speaker getting ready to head to, if he's not there already, into another communist country right now to encourage the believers there, and the churches are spreading even behind the Iron Curtain, even in many of the Arab nations where it is a, a death sentence to pron- pronounce the name of Jesus. Yet men and women, brothers and sisters, are growing spiritually, and their numbers are growing because of what Jesus Christ is doing through the faithful church. What made them faithful? Faithful to God's word, faithful to his name. And so God has given them an open door on earth and God has given them and us an open door to heaven to escape the judgment that is coming upon the whole world. But it's not where the church's story ends tragically because Jesus said there would be another church that would follow the faithful church. Jesus said when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith 
on the earth? Will he find that kind, this kind of faith on the earth? And so we see the lukewarm church. Let's look at verses 14 and following, and then we'll walk back through this incredible and scary letter. Verse 14 of Revelation 3, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans writes, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning, literally the, the source, the origin of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, neither, excuse me, neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest, I'm rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing, and knowest not, knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, Pay attention to this. I stand at the door and knock. And not only does he knock, but he is speaking through this letter and through men and women that he has called to share this message with the church. He is speaking to this church. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, because I'm not in that church. I'm not in there. So if you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come into you and I will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. And am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now let's talk about this opening address, verse 14, just for a moment. The word Laodicea comes from two Greek words. The first is leos, which means people, and the second, uh, dike, which can be translated a number of different ways, custom, right, judicial decision. The point is that the word Laodicea means the people rule or the people's way. Or the people have judged. The judgment of the people is how Charles Ryrie translated that word. See, Paul told Timothy, he warned Timothy that there was a time coming when the church would be typified. Typified. Not that it would be just a little segment but that the church would be typified by what he called itching ears. I want you to to hear what Paul said about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, Timothy. Preach the word, DJ. Preach the word. Anyone who is teaching the Bible in a Bible study in a Sunday morning Bible study class, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. That means whether it's popular to say it or it's unpopular. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering because people are not going to want to hear it. So you're going to have to keep sharing it and you're going to have to put up with the reaction. But you have to have long suffering and right doctrine. Here's why. For the time will come. And we would say now is. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Do you know that sound doctrine is something that you have to endure? You know it's not supposed to be easy to sit through a message. That's why we don't do 20-minute messages very often, sometimes. Sometimes for sake of time. 
It's not supposed to be a TED Talk. It's not supposed to be a pep talk. It's something that has to be endured. We have comfortable seats here. Our brothers and sisters in China are huddled together in little apartments where they don't have the room to sit down like home Bible studies that I've sat in with my feet propped up. And I was uncomfortable if I didn't have anywhere to put my feet, right? I got to hold my drink while we have this Bible study. What kind of place, what kind of, what, what kind of Bible study are you hosting here, Peter? We're so spoiled. We're so spoiled. And sound doctrine is something that has to be endured. But the time's coming when people don't want to endure it anymore. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. This latter time's departure from true Christianity will be orchestrated, 1 Timothy chapter 4, by deceitful spirits. People will actually be teaching in the church doctrines of demons. Now, Paul was not the only one to sound the alarm. Peter sounded the alarm in 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 2 and 3, written to the church about false teachers in the church. Peter warned in, in chapter 2, verse 1, that there were false, just as there were false prophets in the Old Testament among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who will privily shall bring in damnable heresies, denying the Lord that bought them, bring upon themselves swift destruction. That doesn't mean that it's going to come when we, mu- when we want it to come right now, today. It means that when it comes, it's coming fast. And there will be no time to repent, no time anymore to repent. But in chapter 3, he says that, verse 2, Ye be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior. Knowing this first church, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Now again, the context here is in the church scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where's the promise of his coming? Where's the promise of his coming? Do you know what the promise of his coming is? Peter knew it because Peter was there when he made the promise. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house there are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That where I am, there you may be also. That's the promise. But you know the rapture is mocked in the church today. It's mocked. Now, some of the mocking is because some of what's been taught about the rapture is not true. Some of what has been taught about the end times is not true. That's why we're studying these books together. But notice the men would mock the rapture. Notice what else they'll deny, Peter said, in the last days. See if this sounds familiar to you. Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, in other words, for all of time, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Nothing's changed. Peter says the second thing they're going to do is they're going to deny biblical creation. Notice what else they're going to be willfully ignorant of, verse 5. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. They're going to deny Genesis chapter 1. They're going to deny Genesis chapter 2. Oh, that was just fairy tales. That's just fables. That God was just relating to people in, in, of the time in the, in the language they understood. We know now. We know now God used evolution. Peter said this is what's going to happen. Peter said this is exactly what the people in the church are going to start teaching. And notice the third thing. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. He said they're going to deny Noah's flood. They're going to say it was a local flood. It didn't. God didn't judge the whole world. Well, how did, how did fish fossils get it on the top of mountains? Well, we don't know about that, but... We just know it didn't happen the way the Bible said. Well, go to every culture in the world. Every culture in the world, around the world, has the flood story as part of their 
history. It's not told correctly. There are elements of the truth in their mythologies. Everybody around the world agrees historically there was a worldwide flood, but not the scoffers of our day. And then the last thing they, they deny, but the heavens and the earth, which now were by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. I've heard even quote-unquote good Bible teachers say, well, yes, there is a hell, but it's not really fire. Don't want to talk about hell. Don't want to talk about judgment. Exactly what Paul, exactly what Peter, exactly what Jesus himself warned is going to happen. And friends, we are there. We're right there. We're here we are. Church in the West. The church of Laodicea. Really, uh, we could debate the date of Laodicea when it really began, but let, let's just say beginning around the 1900s with the advance of uh, an adoption of liberal belief, this old earth idea that seeped its way into the churches by seeping its way first into the seminaries that trained the pastors and then the pastors convinced the people that Darwin was some kind of prophet even though nobody believes actual Darwinism anymore, they believe neo-Darwinism. Dar Darwinism 2.0, they had to change what he taught because what he taught, even secular scientists don't, don't agree with it exactly, what he taught. But he's still a hero, a prophet to them. But what also happened, the evangelism of the church, the biblical preaching of the church began to be replaced with the emphasis on people's feelings and experiences and this movement was punctuated and escalated in the 70s and 80s. My lifetime, my experience with the explosion of the seeker-driven church movement where you have worship services that aren't structured around Jesus. They're not even structured around Christians. We're going to make the church for the unchurched. We're going to make church on Sunday for the unsaved. Where do you see that in here? You don't see it anywhere. That's modern marketing. That came from Peter Drucker, who was a pagan. And his pastoral disciples tried to say he was a, a Christian. I have never read anything that Peter Drucker said that sounded, or heard in any of his interviews, anything that remotely sounded Christian. He was a radical socialist. And he decided since he couldn't get the unions to accomplish the radical transformation of America that he envisioned, that he would use the churches. And so he changed the meaning of the church. Now we have pastor, we have pastor of, of the, I don't even want to call him a pastor. We have the leader, the founder of one of the largest uh, churches in America saying the pastor is shepherd. That's an old model. We need to abandon that. The pastor today needs to be the CEO. The pastor needs to see, you don't need a shepherd. You don't need a, a pastor. You don't need a bishop and overseer. You need a CEO. Adrian Rogers said that the difference between Christ and the Antichrist is that Jesus gives you a name. The Antichrist gives you a number. And the question is, when Jesus comes back, is your name going to be called or is your number going to be up? Laodicea needs to recognize that this is not about, we're not trying to get a bunch of people together here to feel good about themselves, just to have somewhere where their kids can go and be safe on a Sunday morning. Western church now is experience-based. It's consumer-based, big, small, and small churches, both. Western churches are now dominated by the desires and the decisions of the congregation, the desires and the decisions of the target audience, the target culture. We're going to just try to reach 20s and 30-year-olds. I sat in a church I don't think there's much chance that the former pastor is listening to this, so I'll just, because he's going to know exactly if he was, I was I'm talking about him. Came up to me after, this is a church for artists. Artists have special needs, and so our church is specifically a church for artists. It was in downtown Atlanta where there were a lot of artists. I think if I had a church for artists in Cumberland, be a pretty small group that would be willing to come to a church that's just for artists. 
But Laodiceans can be found in liberal churches, progressive churches, emergent churches, word, faith churches, seeker-driven churches, woke churches. Now, many of these churches are large, they're influential, their CEOs are household names, but they are healthy and wealthy in appearance only. And the tragedy is that this church age reflects the dusk of the church age, particularly in the West. Because remember, Philadelphia is still here. Sardis is still here. Thyatira is still here. All of those four churches are told about the coming judgment. Only faithful Philadelphia and those who come out of the other churches are going up. Everybody else is going through, and you don't want to go through what's coming. Now let's look at the revelation of Jesus Christ again, verse 14 in Revelation chapter 3. These things saith the Amen. I have to apologize to my son. He told me the other day that one of the names of Jesus is Amen. I said, Elijah, Jesus' name is not Amen. He said, yes, it is. When we pray, we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. That means his name is Amen. I said, that's not what it means, bud. And then Daddy sat down and studied for this message, and he was reminded. The Holy Spirit gave me a little tap on the shoulder. Jesus says, I am the Amen. What does that mean? It means I have the final word. You have as many words as you want. He gets the final word. Aren't you glad, though? Church, aren't you glad? Bill Gates can have as many words as he wants. Klaus Schwab can say as much as he wants. How they're going to change the world. They're going to microchip all of us. They're going to have us eating insects. They can say all they want. They can do all they want. But only when God says they can do it, and only after we're gone, can they do everything they want. He has the final word. He has the final word. He will always have the final word. Number two, the faithful and true witness. See, what does that mean? It means he is the truth, John 14, 6. And his word is truth, as we, say, as we heard the choir sing about this morning. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. John 17, 17, I share it with you often in the garden, praying for you. Jesus said, Father, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Change them, set them apart by my word, by your word, by the sword of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's word. See, the Laodiceans have gotten where they've gotten because they're not faithful to the word of God the way that the Philadelphia church is faithful. The word of God is open to interpretation for the Laodiceans. You know, interesting historical note. When the church gathered at the Council of Ephesus, hundreds of years after God completed the canon, they were debating on whether to include this book or that book. And most of the books of our New Testament, there wasn't a lot of debate, but some of them there were debate. Some people wanted Jude in the Bible. Some people said Jude shouldn't be in the Bible. It quotes the book of Enoch. Some people said the book of Enoch should be in the Bible. Others said the book of Enoch wasn't written by Enoch. It shouldn't be in the Bible. Some people said the book of 2 Peter is very different than the book of 1 Peter. It sounds like it was written by somebody different. Well, that's probably because one of them was written by Peter himself and one of them was written by his scribe we've talked about before but there were people who debate the book of revelation was one of the ones that some of the churches didn't want in the bible they tried to get it out of the bible guess which way the church at laodicea voted that doesn't belong in the bible the book of revelation doesn't belong in the bible we don't believe john really wrote that i wonder why they felt felt that but see that's the spirit of laodicea We get to decide what God's word says. We get to decide what God's word means. But Jesus says to us and to them and to everyone, I am the faithful and true witness. I will tell you what is true. Number three, I am the beginning of the creation. Again, that word arche means origin. I am the source. I'm your creator. 
I don't care what Charles Darwin says. I don't care what any scientist today says. I don't care what Neil deGrasse Tyson says, any of them. I created this world. I spoke it into to existence. It all belongs to me. You belong to him, saved or unsaved, living and dead. It all belongs to him. Now, here's the examination of the church. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. See, Laodicea was a very wealthy city. It was a banking center, so they had incredible wealth from the banks. They had theaters everywhere. It was almost like the New York City of its day, in a way. Theaters, temples. They had a medical school there that was world famous. In fact, they produced an eye salve as a medicinal treatment that was world famous called solarium. Solarium, I think is how you pronounce that. And they were also known for their black, glossy wool that they produced in their garments. But they had a problem, and that is that because of the minerals in the streams around Laodicea, the water was not drinkable. I mean, you could try, but it would make you sick. So, you, so what they would have to do is they'd have to pump the water from um, Hierapolis to get the hot water from the springs there and the cold water they would pump in uh, from Colossae. I want to read just an excerpt from David Jeremiah's study Bible. It said, the water of Laodicea was not drinkable, so the city had its water pumped in from the surrounding cities. Hot water from Hierapolis, cold water from Colossae. However, by the time it reached Laodicea, it was lukewarm, just like the faith of the church there. To the Lord, their lukewarm ways were so disgusting, they could not be stomached. Now, in this verse... And I agree with Dr. Jeremiah. Both hot and cold are good things. He's not saying, I wish you were sold out for me or just reject me. He's not saying that. I've heard that taught before. He's not saying hot is good and cold is bad or cold is good and hot is bad. He's not saying that either. Hot water has some good purposes. I do not like lukewarm coffee. I don't, know. I don't like cold coffee either. I don't know how some of y'all drink that stuff. But I better get my two cups in the morning or I'm not much worth I like my coffee hot, just, just, you know, cool enough that I can drink it. But I also like a cold bottle of water someday, especially outside working. You want that cold water. See, hot has its wor worth and cold has its worth. Lukewarm mineral water will make you puke. That's the point here. The, the Bible goes on, the study Bible goes on to say, to first century readers, they were not measures of spiritual temperature, but of vitality and usefulness. The water from the hot springs of Hierapolis was useful for healing and restoration. The cold water at Colossae was refreshing to drink and quenched people's thirst. But the water that reached Laodicea was distasteful and unsatisfying. And so here's the condemnation of the church in verses 16 and 17. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Just like you would if you drank something that was not what you thought it was. Maybe, you're, maybe your kid mistook the, your cup for something else and stuck his paintbrush in it or something. I don't know. You tried to take a swig of that, and it went everywhere. You said, that's my reaction when I look at your church. Now, here's why. Here's the problem. This is not a problem of spiritual immaturity. This is not about lukewarm Christianity in the sense that these are true Christians who just, eh, they're struggling in their faith. No, God will discipline that. God doesn't spit you out when you struggle with your faith. He disciplines you. He disciplines his children. Now, he's going to discipline this church, but in a different way. This is about spiritual duplicity. This is about people who have a form of godliness but who deny the power of godliness. They're not truly saved. Paul says, 2 Timothy, from such men turn away. And so what Jesus does is he uses the culture and the industry of Laodicea to expose the deadly, self 
deceptions of the Laodicean version of Christianity, which thinks because it is rich, because it is increased with goods, because we're sitting in an air-regulated sanctuary, which is a beautiful place that we have to, to worship the Lord, and, and thank God for it. But don't ever think that because this church is attractive, that that means that Jesus is happy to be here. Jesus is not impressed. Jesus would much rather be in a mud hut with people who sincerely want to worship him than in an American church where everybody's complaining because the temperature should be one degree higher. No, the temperature should be one degree lower. Why did we get this color refuse? Why didn't we get the other color? I think I'm going to go start another church. See, no, I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this word again. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and two words, knowest not. Knowest not. Here's how you become a Laodicean church. Number one, you, knew, you do not know that you are wretched. Jesus' word, not mine. How does a church get to that point? Because they don't teach about sin. They don't use the word sin. They don't talk about sin. Oh, everybody is a sinner, so let's not, let's not talk about this sin or that sin. We want people to feel uncomfortable. I let God worry about that. I'm so spiritual. I let God worry about the conviction. You don't talk about sin. You don't know you're wretched. Friend, I'm a wretch. I'm a wretch. I'm here because everything good in me is Jesus. Everything good in me is the work of the Holy Spirit because I know what I would be like if I didn't know Jesus. I know what I would, and you would not want to be around me. Now, thank God he's changed me. Thank God he's grown me. Thank God he has made me a new creation. Don't look at me that way. I know the same thing about you. I wouldn't want to be around some of you if you weren't saved either. Book of Proverbs. Proverbs thirty. Verse 12, just look at one of these verses. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Boy, is that our generation. Wretched because these churches don't talk about sin. They downplay sin. Number two, miserable. They don't know, they, they don't know they're miserable. You know why? Because these churches are all about self-help. These churches are all about felt needs. We want you to feel good when you come to church. I remember when I went to Kentucky, one of the parents of one of my teens, one of the stepfather of one of my teens, he had just stopped coming to church. I said, Brittany, why didn't you, you know, why doesn't, I, I asked the pastor, well, you know, Brittany's dad doesn't come to church. Yeah, I went and visited him. He told me that um, he doesn't come anymore because when he leaves, he doesn't feel good about himself. And so he just doesn't come anymore. Leo, see, L is not for loser. It's for Laodicean. Laodicean loser. Obsessed with themselves. Lovers of themselves, Paul said. That's how the church is. That's what's going to happen to the church. Love for yourself. Be obsessed about yourself. What's in it for me? Have a friend. Don't want to step on any toes. Yes, I do. When she was a single mom, why doesn't our church, not this church, not this church, why doesn't our church have a ministry to single moms? Why doesn't our church, have, our church doesn't care about single moms. We don't have a ministry for single moms. She got remarried, never complained about it again because it wasn't her need anymore. It wasn't her issue. Now, I'm not saying that that's not a good thing to have. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying we have a human tendency to only see what we are missing. What am I missing? That's what everybody needs to be about. poor. They don't know they're poor. You know why they don't know they're poor? Because they have material riches. They have mistaken material wealth for spiritual blessing. God wants you to be rich. I want you to, I want you to know if you plant a seed in my ministry today, you give me a hundred dollars, God will bless you. You see this suit that I'm wearing today? That's why I don't wear a suit. That's not the only reason I don't wear a suit. That's not the only reason I don't wear a suit. I don't want to look like them hucksters. Now, now we got pastors dressed like me like this, but they're wearing literally $1,000 tennis shoes. 
if I'm ever wearing thousand dollar tennis shoes, it's because I went bowling and I got the wrong shoes when I got done bowling, okay? <laughs> you know what my wife would do if she saw me in thousand dollar tennis shoes? Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to imagine. They don't know they're poor because they've got wealth and they think because I got money, that means God approves of me and that is not what that means. Paul said, I know what it's like to have a lot and I know what it's like to have nothing. And I know what it means to rely on God. See, some of you have a lot, some of you don't have anything. What matters is not what you have in the bank. What matters is what you have stored up your treasures in heaven. That's what, that's what matters. Number four, they're blind. This city, this church that's known for their eye salve. Oh, you think you, see, you think you know the Bible better than all of those people who have gone before you. You think you're the expert in what the Bible means. A guy I used to call a friend. And it was an acquaintance, really, but I would have called him a friend. He got heavily involved into the emergent church. And I remember seeing, I just remember the sickness when I saw a book. I was going through Ollie's where I like to get cheap books. And um, there was a book on the emergent church. And there was his name on the cover as one of the contributors. I thought, that can't be the same guy I went to school, that I knew. I can't, I can't, I so and so was at Liberty University. Blah, 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 blah. Yep, it, that's him. So I read that section. Truth is, is you know, it's not objective. It's, it's what we agree upon in our community. It's what we agree upon in our... Why was the Bible written? Why did Paul write Corinthians? Was it to tell them, you guys made some good choices as a community? No, it was to say the exact opposite. That's why we have a New Testament, because we don't get it right. We need God's correction. But see, they don't know they're blind because they've rejected the authority of God's word. And they don't know that they're naked. What does that mean? What does that mean? See, the clothing here is the righteousness, the robes of righteousness that are given to those of us who have our sins forgiven. We don't want to stand before God in our own righteousness because we'd be naked. Because all our righteousness is filthy rags. But see, this church that was known for their beautiful clothing and everybody wore their Sunday best and they were so good, so well-dressed when they came to church. And Jesus said, oh, you know what I see? I see a bunch of naked people and it ain't pretty. It's sad. It's shameful. But boy, I tell you what, nobody, nobody righteous like the Laodicean church. Oh, they'll be happy to tell you how righteous they are. Nobody loves the poor like the self-righteous Laodicean. Nobody loves the foreigner and the outcast like the self-righteous Laodicean. Nobody loves for you to give your money to their cause. Let the government, let the government do all the compassion. You should be wanting to give your money to the government. Yeah, you th if you think the gov money you give to the government is going to the poor, you were educated in one of their training camps. Look around. I don't care what party you're part of. It's not about politics. They're both two wings of the same dirty bird. I'm going over to this morning. Just hang with me just for a couple more minutes, guys. Let me give you the warning. I'm going to give you the warning to the church really quickly. Jesus came to save sinners. Do you know that? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And God demonstrated that love for us. In this, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus loves Laodiceans. I, need to, I needed that reminder this weekend. I needed that reminder. Jesus loves the Pharisee. Jesus met with Nicodemus. And he gave the gospel to Nicodemus. Jesus loves the self-righteous. But love doesn't mean you only say sweet, kind words to somebody. Why did Jesus say, you're naked, you're miserable, you're wretched? Because I, because I love you. That's why he says that. Because I love you. Listen to what he says in this next verse. Verses 18. And following, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. 
Let me give you three things very quickly. Yes, Jesus loves the lost, and we should too. And so he offers them three things. He gives them, first of all, his counsel. I'm counseling you. Come to me for true riches. Set aside the riches of the world. And come to me for the riches where you don't have to worry about rust and you don't worry about being taxed into oblivion. And you don't have to worry about anybody breaking in to steal it because you're not allowed to carry a gun or own a gun anymore. Put your treasure where I will guard it and I will invest it. And you'll watch it grow for all eternity. Come to me for true righteousness. Come to me for truth itself, he counsels. Incidentally, I, I'm not going to unpack this, but this word counsel is in the plural form. It means to consult together. Jesus said, I consult together. Consult together with who? Consult together with myself. See, this is a picture of, you, we, you see this in the Greek. This is a, a statement on the, the plurality of the oneness of God, that God is one, but God is also three. Explain it to me, preacher. I can't even understand it, but I believe it by faith. Jesus said, I... Father, Son, Spirit, consult together, and we have agreed, the Holy Trinity, that we are offering you, Laodicea, we are offering you true riches, we're offering you true righteousness, we're offering you truth itself, salvation. Number two, Christ, correction, I love you, I will expose your sin because I love you. If you are ignoring your kid's sin, it's not because you love them, it's because you love yourself. We have confused sentimentality with love. I want you to like me. I want you to feel good. I don't want you to curse me. So I'll just pat you on the back when you are rebelling against God. Lower that pat a little bit. Lower that pat a little bit. Christ says, if I love you, I will, I will discipline your sin and be very, very very afraid if you can sin and there's no consequences because that means that God is saying I'm going to give you up for a while I'm going to let you experience Romans chapter 1 what you think you want number three Christ challenge behold I stand at the door and knock I'm not in the preaching in that church I'm not in the worst they might sing my name they might drop my name once in a while in a message out while they talk. You know, I, I told you before I went to a church. Four times I went to this church. The first two times the, the senior pastor wasn't preaching. The only reason I came back is because I wanted to hear him because the guy who was preaching in his place did not say much. And sadly, the pastor, when I finally got to hear the pastor, he didn't say much either. Spent 20 minutes talking about his kids at the beginning of the message. 20 minutes. And I remember, I remember sitting there thinking, I'm glad you love your kids, but I don't know your kids. And I didn't come here to worship your kids. So I gave him one more chance. He did the same. I think the second time it was 15 or 17. I think it was actually 17 minutes if I remember because I was watching. I thought, I want to see how long he talks about his kids today. I don't care about what your kids said in the car for 17 minutes. You want to give me a little story? You want to give me a little insight? Apply the Bible to your life? Great. But I didn't come here to hear about you. Christ says, you want to get to me, you're going to have to come out of that church. And I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. I, but here's the thing, guys. It has to be a personal repentance. Repentance is personal. You have to make a personal decision to trust that Jesus died for your sin, that he rose again for you, that he can give you eternal life. But you have to admit you need a Savior and you need forgiveness. And you have to call upon him to receive it. It's not by your works. It's his grace. You can only receive it through faith. And faith is... Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sin and rose again. And I call upon you right now to forgive me of all my sin. And if you do that today, friend, I promise you, if you mean it from your heart by faith, God will give you his grace and he will, you will be born again and he will sup with you. But here's the warning that you don't see in the English. Sup here means the evening meal. It's the last meal of the day. You got one more chance, Laodicea. It's the last meal. It's the end of the church age, friends. I don't, I'm not sure if the Lord's coming this year or in 10 years, but I believe firmly, I believe firmly with all my heart, the budding of the fig tree was 1948, and we are in the last generation. I believe it with all my heart. So maybe we got 10 years, maybe we got 20 years, I don't know. We may only have two days. We only may only have 10 minutes. He's standing, he's calling. 
it's supper time. You better come. Because remember, Jewish day starts at night, not in the morning. The sun is setting on the church age, friends. Do you know him? If you do, the promise is we'll reign with him. You'll sit on my throne. We'll talk more about the throne, Lord willing, as we get into February. We look at chapter 4. The throne is going to be major, major emphasized. We'll, we'll come back to this. But I want to close with this. As you stand, every head bowed, every eye closed, we must recognize the Spirit's call. If you have an ear, hear what the Spirit is saying to you today. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, God, we need your Spirit, God, to show us where we are in danger of imitating the Laodiceans. God, this is not a Laodicean church. But God, there may be someone who is part of a Laodicean church who's listening today, and God, all of us need to be aware of the influence on the Internet, in the bookstores, on the radio, of the Laodicean spirit of our day. God, we are in need of your truth, your conviction today. May your spirit move among us right now. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. This is a familiar hymn. If you need to come forward, if you need Jesus, don't leave here today until you've talked to us. Don't walk out that door. This, the Lord could come back today. You could be called today. This is the day of salvation. Let's sing this hymn together. Do you need to come? Is there something you need to get? Do business with God? Don't leave here today before you do. Grace has taught my heart to hear and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace Let's raise our voices, see how loud we can sing his praise as we sing. When we
Father, we thank you and praise you, God, that to those who overcome, God, we will rule and reign with you, God. We're going to not be here for all of the wrath and the judgment that's coming, God. But God, as we live in that expectation, may we remember that there are many, many around us. The vast majority of people we see every day we do not have that hope yet. May we be motivated and have opportunity this week to share the gospel at these last days and this last hour with a dying world. We love you and thank you, Jesus. Ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Lord willing, we'll be able to have service tonight. I hope to see you then. God bless you. You're dismissed.